Okay, here we go. Uh, so, uh, if you can't judge from this slide and my shirt, then I work at Frantic as a senior developer. And today, I would like to talk to you about web components and, and uh, particularly how we sort of think around the technology. Like, we have the technology, but how do we think around the technology? Uh, First, I want to shout out Angular Finland for building me no pressure at all with this tweet, which basically states that I will change your view on the World Wide Web in the next like 20 minutes. So, uh, first of all, thank you guys and no pressure. And to you I say, I will try. Very hard. Okay, so uh, two things today, technology and imagination. Um, so. My question to you is, are we using our imagination? Because often we find ourselves in a situation where we definitely have some technology, like in this case web components, is like a kind of hot off the press of the web standards train. But have we sort of exhausted our imagination in sort of thinking about what we could do with this technology? Uh, Sorry, I have to look because my mirroring is not working, so we're going to do it like this. So just a little recap of like web components and what has so far happened in the standard. And to start this, I want to show you an HTML element. Like we're going to go all the way back. So this is an HTML element. It's a button. I'm a button. You've probably all seen this by now, or then you have some reading to do, if not. Uh, OK. so. What is Web Components? Web Components is this uh, series of technologies. There's like four of them, but one of them is currently dying and is, as you can see it there, it's all gray because it doesn't have any oxygen and it's going away. So we have custom elements, uh, we have Shadow Dome, and we have HTML templates, and then HTML imports was really great, but Mozilla didn't want it, so it's dead. So goodbye. HTML imports. Uh, and in a somewhat interesting linguistic uh, twist, when you use web components, uh, of which one of the, the participating technologies is custom elements, you use the technologies and you end up with custom elements. So this is something that I really like about explaining this whole technologies, this like two-tiered naming thing. But yeah, web components is those three technologies of which one is custom elements and when you use them together you get custom elements. So now everything's clear. Uh, okay, so here's a custom element. Now we have a, now we made our own element. Now it's a cool button. As you can see now it's cool. It's wearing sunglasses. It's amazing. Uh, okay, so what is angular elements? Uh, Angular Elements is, is really like, Angular Elements are uh, like, they are custom elements, but they are specifically made with like the Angular framework. So you can package your Angular app, like any Angular app, like to our custom element, and then it's called an Angular Element. See, there's another linguistic thing. So it's an Angular element, but it's also a custom element. So you really get to pick and choose which one you want to use. Okay, so so far we have learned that we can make our own HTML elements and we can make HTML elements out of Angular apps using Angular elements. Uh, so, what can we do with this technology? Now, if you go and you go read like a guide or the Angular documentation page, uh, you get a lot of stuff like this. So uh, we can do custom buttons and we can do some text formatting and we can do pop-ups and models and widgets and, and all these kind of things. But um, when I'm reading these, I, I kind of can't escape the feeling that they're all basically just cool buttons. Like they don't seem significant or, or life-changing. And if I'm going to change your view of the World Wide Web, I need something better than like a, like a calendar widget on your web page. Right. Uh, so, imagination, are we using it? I don't think so. Like, I think cool button is cool, but it's not using the full potential of what we can do. Uh, 
And to talk about using our imagination, we are going to go back to the very complicated HTML element called button. Uh, the reason we go back is that I want us to, because I, I presented to you and you were like, yeah, that's a button element, why is it in this talk? So now I just want to very briefly talk about what the button element actually is. First of all, it has a definition. Like this is the stuff that presumably like smart people at W3C are writing. It's like the definition. Uh, I've slightly abridged the W3C definition of a button, but it comes out to something like button has text and you can click on it. Uh, now what else does a button element have to be useful? Well, it has an implementation. And if you ask the question, where is the code for the button element, then the answer is like kind of like nowhere, but also everywhere, because like everything that handles HTML has some sort of it must have some sort of implementation of the button element. So I haven't personally done this, but I imagine the process is something akin to like engineer reads W3C spec and then they're like, oh yeah, button element has text and you can click on it. And then they go and write it in like C++ or uh, Java or whatever for their like platform. And for whatever reason this thing has worked reasonably well for 25 years. Like it certainly doesn't sound like it should work, but it has. Uh, okay, so this is kind of the, the point why I'm showing you the, the button element. Because it's really, if we think about it, it has a definition and the implementations of which there are several and there will be more of those implementations and the old implementations have gone away. So really, the button element is an API for something because it's like it like the definition exists outside the implementation. This is kind of like why we like APIs because they hide complexit complexity and 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 make us able to sort of like switch out our implementations and sort of be very flexible. Uh, well, I said it already. Who creates HTML elements? W3C presumably does, and sometimes companies do it on their own, but that's a bad idea. Never do that again. Thank you. Uh, at least, you know, without, without using the, the custom elements spec. Like in the past, it was a bad idea. Uh, bad idea. Now it's a good idea. Uh, okay, so cool button, which is a custom element, uh, is very similar to the regular button element in that it has a definition and an implementation. And the cool button does what I want. I want it to be a cool button. So now it is. Like that's the definition part of the thing. So now I am W3C and I have all the power to make all the cool buttons I want. And I can implement it in any technology that can do custom elements, one of which is Angular, but really like you can do it with JavaScript, plain JavaScript and many, 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 many other frameworks. Uh, and cool button is also an API, because I just defined it that it has some properties and then I implement it in something, but if I don't like my implementation, I can adjust my implementation uh, without adjusting the definition or I can do both but the key thing is that they're separate from each other they don't have like this sort of faithful connection so uh, who creates custom elements you do like I can do it you can do it like anyone can create a custom element like I'm like somewhat surprised that this wasn't like like a bigger headline because that Hey, by the way, after 25 years, you can now create your own HTML elements. Like this, I don't recall seeing this headline anywhere, because it, to me it sounds cool if I say it like that. Uh, so, let's try again. Last time we tried this, we could do like cool buttons and widgets and pop-ups and things. Maybe with our uh, renewed imagination, we can now do more. Maybe. Okay, so let's try. Let's try to connect things. Uh, what do I want to connect? Uh, I want to connect an existing corporate platform to an Angular application. Has anyone ever done this? I bet someone has. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've done it even in Angular JS, and uh, yeah, it's not always pretty. Uh, I would say most people would admit, at least privately, that usually there's a lot of 
what I would call glue, like between there. And uh, the glue does put the things together, but the problem is that it's very, very hard to separate them once you've glued them together and you didn't really create any like added value in the process. It's just like a one-time integration. Now, what if we put a custom element between our things? We say that, hey, uh, existing corporate platform, you know about HTML because you must, because everything that is talking to a user online knows about HTML. Or at least it's very, very hard to like, not know about HTML and operate like a web service. So if we do this, then the thing is okay for the corporate platform because it's like, yeah, I know HTML, like I've been probably around most of the 25 years, so it's fine. And then Angular app is like, yep, Angular elements, I can become an HTML element, you can do this. Great. Uh, also, if it would happen that in the, the web development frameworks or tools would ever change, like this has never happened to me, but it could happen, you know, like there could be some new cool framework that replaces the old framework kind of thing, then we're fine because we made our definition in the element and now the underlying implementation is exchangeable. We actually have the API against which we can implement things. like like. Browser vendors have been doing this all the time with the button element. Like, I doubt that there is, like, any production code in, well, there might be an Internet Explorer, but basically, you know, Google wasn't around when the button element was devised, and they can still, like, code one, so it's probably fine. And also, one day, you know, a, a much longer time from now, the existing corporate platform might become a new platform, but the new platform is probably going to understand HTML unless, you know, something better comes along, but then this whole talk is invalid and you won't care about web components. So let's just assume that HTML carries on for another 25 years or so. So we could do this and now we have, instead of glue, we have like a reasonable API in our integration and we can like focus on reasonable things and make sort of good decisions and good development time on all of our things. And having done this, I have to say that uh, it, you, you first sort of just do it and then slightly later when you're using your imagination, you start realizing the actual benefits that you have gained versus the thing where, you know, you just took the platform and then you just inject a bunch of JavaScript and HTML and you have some div that says that it's the app and you inject it all there and like, because that works, but the problem is it doesn't create an API and doesn't create any value. Next one, we could learn a new language. Uh, for this, I wanna show you e-commerce 2019. This is from a real example, which I have hopefully sufficiently anonymized. Like, I didn't have anything to do with this, and I doubt any of you did either. If someone recognizes their code, then please don't say anything, and we'll all save face here. Uh, I mean, this is like what happens. Like, w with a lot of websites, like if you open the source, you know, have you ever told like anyone who asked like what the web development is like, well, you know, you can open the dev, dev tools and you can look at the code, and then you remember that, oh yeah, all the code looks like this and no one can, like including me and us, can't figure out what is going on because everything is just this sort of generated HTML, CSS nonsense that we have somehow provided. Uh, the problems here that I have is that it's a mix of like various different kind of definitions and also that we are using for e-commerce the same set of nouns that Tim Berners-Lee came up to, you know, write these three paragraph things for the internet on the, like, the first World Wide Web network. And if I would formulate the question, like, is it sensible to model e-commerce in a language that mostly speaks about paragraphs and headings and, and like, you know, like it's, it's about like top-down text formatting, then I think most people would say that, no, I don't want to model my, my you know, e-commerce in that language. And like, if this was code, 
Like, I'm pretty sure you would return this pull request that, no, I don't want to see this, this is awful, make it go away. So, uh, I'm going to make it go away, and this is just like literally the first thing I came up with web components. What if we did this? Like, you could do that, like today, like you could replace all the soup. Like, you can still have all the soup you want in the web components, but the trick is in that it's now in the implementation and not in your definition. And we could go back to, like, if we did this, then we could potentially actually read the source of a web page, which is a very interesting concept that we might someday return to. And also, if I would show this to, like, the person who is not the developer and who's, like, responsible for the e-commerce, I think they would say that, yeah, I can sort of, like, like I know what's going on. Here. This, it, these are words that I'm familiar like I'm not familiar with heading and div and paragraph but I understand what like my product is so that's something we're thinking about and finally um, I want to talk to you about like breaking a monolith and I'm pretty sure like everyone at least this conference has this monolith like in your like portfolio as we say in the business uh, so, uh, this circle is, for the purposes of this talk, is a single page application. The sing if you haven't heard, single page application is how you do everything nowadays. All other methods are wrong and you shouldn't do. Maybe you should, but anyway, this is the single page application, like Angular provides. And what we do is usually we start sort of putting stuff in our single page application. So we put like all these components and services and things in there, like the product component goes there, the cut component, and then we have something that renders like a 16 by 16 logo somewhere, or you know, because it needs to have a component, I don't know. Uh, and then obviously we deploy this, which means that we take all the source from there, you know, the hopefully TypeScript, and then we package it all up and we put it online and minify it and then we look at the compile time and we are like, where is IV? I want to use the new rendering engine because this is slow. Uh, and then, but then one day, uh, our logo component, which is uh, responsible for the business critical task of rendering the 16 by 16 image that you have somewhere, uh, there's a little source code error there. Now, uh, what happens to our deployment pipeline at this point? Does anyone know? Yes. Everything is now bad because the, the logo component is bad. And here is kind of the monolith that we have today. It's like this inconvenient sort of uh, non-separation of concerns which leads to weakness <coughs> in the deployment pipeline. Now. Is there something like, I, I'm pretty sure you're going to guess that I'm going to suggest something with web components for this, and you would be right. Okay, so we're going to try again. We have another single page application as a blue circle. Um, now we're going to put a bunch of web components in it, like, and we're just going to like literally just insert them like we would any web components or really like HTML elements. Like if you think about it, when you're using HTML elements, you're sort of dependency injecting the DOM or the browser rendering into your application, like something like that is happening. And because these all have their separate implementation, we can like have a couple of Angular apps maybe, or you know, like any technology you want. So you're deploying to create the working definition of the element, but you no longer have them in the same sort of gigantic monolithic thing. And then maybe the logo component like, I'm a brave man, but I might implement it in just like plain JavaScript instead of an Angular app. So, by this point, we have created the ability to, first of all, not break our deployment pipeline every time we made a small mistake somewhere, because we can sort of control the deployment of each of these things separately. And we have also created the opportunity to actually use multiple technologies in our project instead of like, getting into the discussion like which, which framework are we using for the next 12 months, which is like, kind of like a silly discussion to have in a, in a computing sense, like we should be able to do this. And of course, new technologies come, we can just replace them because we had the API of the custom elements. And finally, 
if the, the application goes away, we still have our elements and they can go live a happy life, you know, somewhere else in some other context. And I think by doing this, we have actually created some assets instead of like technical depth and, and misery for our thing. Uh, I mean, these are just some takeaways that I listed quickly like today that web components, the headline is you get to create your own HTML elements, like that should make you excited. Uh, custom elements form a powerful layer of abstraction for your architecture, like that to me is the, the central potential of the technology right now in my head. And the technology is out, like the spec is done, it actually uh, works in real browsers, like it's not like a theory, like you may need some polyfills and things, but you can actually use it. So now it's really actually down to us to just use our imagination. Thank you. Before you continue, the one We have a question. Okay. Hi, thank you. Uh, I do have one question though. So uh, right now the benefit of that monolith approach that uh, you talked about before is you have a single page application and most of the code is written in one place with one technology and you can tree shake that and remove CSS code that is not necessary and remove extra code that is not used. So what happens do you think to that when uh, three teams uh, start de uh, de uh, developing the same web page and two of them decide to, yeah, Lodash is a great idea, let's include Lodash in our bundle and there's like five megabytes of Lodash in each of the element implementations. So uh, how would you kind of fix that concern? Uh, I think it's a very good question. It's like, to me, this is like one of the, 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 the problems that, you know, literally just waiting will solve eventually. Because like we didn't originally, in Angular world, we didn't have tree shaking and things were slow. But like my, my, like my way of tackling that concern is literally, you know, like if this is a problem, then like either invest in solving it or then just decide that, you know, time will solve it. Uh, and I think it's also like sort of, um, you can change your perspective in a way that of course you measure the, the whole application, the whole service, but really you're talking about like individual implementations. And I think it would be sort of interesting what would happen if instead of optimizing one application, you would have like several teams or people sort of optimizing their sort of approach to the individual element, which is like what I would go for here and I like last time I saw a website it was so full of like third-party JavaScript that I don't think like a couple of web components could even make a dent to it so yes this is a problem there's no solution but I think uh, simply like waiting will provide the optimizations in this case thanks, thanks.